Can you say that again, church? Well, happy Sabbath. It's good to see all of you here. I know that um, with Omicron blowing up, we have a number of people that are either, either needing to quarantine or because of um, people that they have in their life or their own health concerns are needing to be careful. And I want to welcome all of those who are joining us on the live stream and are still a part of our church family. Even if you're not here in person, we want you to know that we're glad you're with us and worshiping. What do you say, church? Amen. Amen. Um, yeah, it is an amazing time to be alive. I was uh, very interested to see, I think it was yesterday, that uh, we had 23,000 new cases of, of COVID in Michigan. I don't know if anyone else saw that. But um, if there's a time to be praying for the health of our state and the health of our friends and neighbors, it is now. And I'm grateful we don't need to be afraid. We serve a living God. What do you say? And uh, he is in control and is working all things out according to his will. Well, as we begin, would you bow your heads with me? Before we pray, thank you, Emily, for that song. It was beautiful. Let's bow our heads for prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, it's a high Sabbath. It's a delight to be here. It's a delight to have others joining us over live stream. It's a delight to be worshiping before your throne. And I know right now there's a lot of concern, unrest, fear, sickness. As we're here in these, this sacred room, we ask that your angels will come and speak peace. Your Holy Spirit will come close to each and every one of us who are either here or tuned in. And you'll speak peace to our minds. Now as we meditate on your word, may you guide what we study in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn with me to the book of John. I've wrestled with what to share this morning. We're going to be starting a sermon series on Elijah and studying through the story of Elijah and the critical lessons we can learn as people who live on the verge of the second coming and are called to carry the Elijah message with us to the world. But as I was uh, uh, wrestling, I was planning this morning to actually take some time to look at the beginning of that before we separated for our our time of foot washing and communion, but Holy Spirit's convicted me to hold that until next week. You won't want to miss where we start next week. It's a powerful study that we're going to begin, and, and we're actually going to go to John chapter 13. When you're there, if you'd let me know by saying amen. It would have been an interesting time to be alive. The disciples uh, have been through some rather unusual experiences over the last three and a half years. Not all of them have been with Christ for the entire three and a half years, but over the last three and a half years, they had seen Jesus do incredible work for the, the furtherment and the establishment of his kingdom. They had watched as he had healed those who were sick. They had seen him raise the dead. They had observed as he presented the the powerful truths of God's word in a way that if someone was willing would win them over to his side. It must have been interesting to be there in John 4 as he was talking to the woman at the well. Someone who had been cast out by society but Jesus offers her the gift of hope must have been interesting to hear the story of John chapter 3 when Christ meets with Nicodemus. And you keep going through all of the different stories. They were there when the demoniacs met them there on the shore of the Sea of Galilee as they landed on the other side of the Gennesaret. And had, these men had come tearing towards them and they had run and they had seen Jesus stand unafraid and unmoved as these men came there and then cast out 
the forces of darkness, the evil spirits, and they came back and they saw the men sitting at the feet of Jesus clothed, and what does the Bible say? In their right mind. They'd seen Jesus face opposition and persecution from the scribes and Pharisees. They had heard of the rumors that they were going to kill the Son of God. There was unrest in the society there. There was, yes, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and yes, they, could, they would get almost to sword points, and in fact, later on, as you get closer to the siege, they would get to the point of sword points in their disagreements about their various political and philosophical and religious beliefs. But the scribes and Pharisees were beginning to unite against their hatred of Jesus Christ. It's interesting. How the world can unite against truth. So coming to John chapter 13, there's a lot of unrest. Unfortunately, the disciples aren't united. How well does an army do getting ready to go into battle if the soldiers don't know how to march together and how to be in order and follow the orders that they're given? Is that an army you would want to be a part of? Let me ask that again. Would you want to be a part of an army that wasn't organized? No. John chapter 13. In this moment of turmoil, in this moment when there's unrest in the hearts of the disciples, in this moment when there is confusion, Jesus calls the disciples to focus on service. And ministering to other people. Notice this in John chapter 13, starting in verse 31. Are you there? John chapter 13, verse 31. Notice what it says. So when they had gone out, Jesus said, they've left the upper room. Christ has washed the feet of the disciples. He has served. They've partaken of the bread and the juice. And then Christ says this. So as when he had gone out, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him and in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall not be with you a little while. I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, verse 34, what does he say? A new what? Commandment I give to you. That you what? Love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. Verse 35, by this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have what? Love for one another. In this moment of turmoil, unrest and fear, Jesus doesn't tell the disciples, focus on fighting for your personal freedom and rights. He says, focus on service. He doesn't tell them the greatest thing you can do is go out and tell the world that you deserve your freedoms. He tells them to focus on what? Service. I think we, we need to be very careful that as Christians, we don't become so focused on our rights. We perceive as our personal needs that we forget that God has called us to service and putting others ahead of myself. With me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to begin in verse 38. Now, I would encourage you in your own time to read all of the next 10 verses. For the sake of time here, because our time is quite limited, I'll just read a few of the verses and make a couple of comments. 
I encourage you to read all of this. This is, of course, in the middle, at the beginning, I should say, of the Sermon on the Mount, the first third, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, are those three powerful chapters that contain the Sermon on the Mount. But notice verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you not to what? What does Jesus say? Say it with me. What does he say? Do not what? Resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you to take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him how many? Two. Give to him who asks, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. You've heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, what does Jesus say? Love your enemies. Bless those who do good to those who, and pray for those who, what's that next word? Spitefully use you and persecute you. I guess I am going to read it all the way through. It's just too good to stop. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Church, we're called to come to a place of loving Jesus and others more than ourselves. And isn't this what Christ then goes on to demonstrate to the world? He leaves the upper room, can continue to trace the rest of the sermon there. He shares a, some thoughts with his disciples. There's that powerful, powerful prayer there in John chapter 17. And then he goes and He's hauled before Ananias, Caiaphas, Pilate. When he was slapped, did he resist? No. Was his crucifixion wrong? Yeah. Was he unjustly being accused? Yes. Were his freedoms being taken away? Yes. Don't tell me that he was a man of free when he was there. And yet I would submit that Jesus was free in his heart because he was able to stay unangry, undefensive, and focused on saving the world. And what Jesus was, by his grace, you and I can be, what do you say? And I would encourage us, there's a lot of turmoil in our world right now. There's a lot of debate and anger and frustration and upsetness about all kinds of different things on all sides of the political aisle, the religious aisle, and every other you can find. But let's not forget why we're here. We're here to serve. We're here to minister and to love like Jesus did. Isn't that what you want? That's what I want. And you all know, you've known me for four years, I am not perfect at that, but by God's grace, I want to be, don't you? So in a few moments, we're going to separate up and follow the example of Christ and his disciples, and we're going to wash each other's feet. And I would encourage you, now maybe this is a little awkward for you. Maybe you've never done it before. That's okay. You can just watch if you're not comfortable doing it. And foot washing is for those who have been baptized by immersion. But if you're a Christian and you're here and you've been baptized, we would love to have you join us. But during this time, we are washing each other's feet. There's several different symbolisms. But one of the symbolisms is to remind each other that we're equal at the foot of the cross and we're called to serve. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Father in heaven, we don't want to be focused on self, self-seeking, self-serving, trying to defend our personal ideas and what we think is right. It's not about me. It's about you. 
about the people you want to touch around me. Oh, Father, please take selfishness out of my heart. Please remove it from the hearts of my dear friends here and my dear friends that are joining us online. Teach us how to live the words of Jesus, to love like he did, to care like he did. And Father, as we do this, may others see Jesus in our words, our actions, in our deportment. Now as we go to wash each other's feet, thank you for going with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd just like to remind you, ladies, you're downstairs. Walk down the hallway and you'll be in the back underneath in the basement back there in the fellowship hall. Gentlemen, you'll be in the primary. And uh, couples, if you want to wash each other's feet together, we're set up over in the school gym. Uh, God bless you. We'll see you back here for the partaking of the emblems as soon as we're done with the foot washing service.